Well, that's a tough act to follow, but I'll see what I can do. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless, says Mother Teresa. When was the last time that someone spoke into your life? I mean, really offered you a word of encouragement, praise, understanding, or support. Now think back, not just recently, but in your life. What have been defining words for you? Times when others shared memorable words that have shaped your life in some way. Now this isn't another share with your neighbor sermon, so don't get nervous. I only ask you to remember these things to make a simple point. Our speech has power, and our words make a difference. Words can bring us together or tear us apart, mend relationships or start wars, create beauty or cause devastation. And yet in a world that is filled to the brim with communication, I wonder how mindful we are of the ways in which we use the powerful tool of our own words. Our gospel text for today is one of healing, but remarkably, it has very little to do with health in the traditional sense. It's not so much about a malady being removed as it is about the wholeness of relationships, the well-being of community, the strength of trust. So we're gonna read this text sort of together Um, But if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. I'm also going to have it on the screen. And just as a heads up, I'm going to be interrupting the story a lot, which is why it's good to have it in front of you. So, the story begins. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there. Okay, first pause. So, A centurion is a Roman soldier. Jews and Romans at this time generally didn't get along. The Romans were occupying land that the Jews had, and as you can imagine, the Jewish people didn't love it. So when these people thought of centurions, when the audience that is hearing this story for the first time hears this, they immediately think, oh, centurion, bad guy, bully, not a friend. So a centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking Jesus to come and heal his slave. Two more important things here. It's pretty unusual for a soldier like this to give two figs about a slave of theirs. I hate to say it, but at the time, slaves were pretty dispensable. There are always more. They're everywhere. You could go buy one in the public market. And later, when this Roman speaks, he uses a very intimate word for the slave, effectively calling the slave his child. All that to say, it's touching and remarkable that this soldier cares so much about the slave of his, that he goes to such extraordinary lengths for his healing and uses such an intimate term. Second, did you notice that this bad guy Roman effectively reaches across the aisle to the Jewish elders to ask for their help? These same elders who probably spend their morning coffee breaks moaning about this horrible Roman occupation and who listen every day to the sufferings of their people who are oppressed by this regime. It's pretty hard to imagine that kind of thing happening today. Two such opposing forces coming together for such a powerless, voiceless, vulnerable, hurting individual. I know all this stuff from ages ago can sound pretty boring when I don't interrupt the story. If I would have just read this. But... Jewish guy this, Roman guy that, whatever. But it's crazy when you really crack into it, which is why I think it's worth sort of ripping it to pieces here. So let's see what happens next. When they came to Jesus, that's right, the Jewish elders were like, sure, we'll go to Jesus for you. When they came to Jesus, (laughs) um, when they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. Now you might be saying, Seth, wait, I thought he was the horrible bad guy, and now they're saying all these nice things about him. You're right. Let me explain. So as a group, the Romans weren't very kind to Jews. 
But these particular elders were able to see beyond the stereotypes and hear the heart of this man, able to see the good that he had done, see him as an individual, as a guy who wants to help his friend, not as an enemy of the other group trying to manipulate them into doing trying to manipulate him into doing them a favor. So it sounds pretty reasonable, right? But it's rare and remarkable. And did you notice the glowing review that they gave him? They appealed to Jesus earnestly. They used their words to build up their supposed enemy. They spoke from the heart. They spoke with generosity. They spoke with his pain in their hearts. And as it turns out, they're pretty convincing. Now, not that Jesus is terribly hard to win over, especially when there's like an ill child in the picture, but still, their words had a difference. So, we read, And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. Now, a Roman centurion with an inferiority complex is a rare breed indeed. What I mean is that Roman soldiers don't generally humble themselves like this. It's actually really sweet that he has such reverence for Jesus' power, such respect for his authority. You see, centurions were pretty high up in the ranks of the Roman army, and so they were used to being the ones commanding and demanding respect from others. Rarely were they the ones to be self-effacing, obedient, humble. But here the roles are reversed, which says a lot about how this man felt towards Jesus. He speaks with humility and kindness, with respect and understanding. He continues, But only speak the word, and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. To this one, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and the slave does it. Now he's starting to sound more like a Roman officer, showing how powerful his words can be. I say jump, they say how high. But again, he places immeasurable trust in Jesus' power and in the power of Jesus' words. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I just love that Jesus was amazed. I imagine that, being God and all, it would take a lot for Jesus to be astonished. And yet he was so touched by this man's care and concern for his dear sweet servant that Jesus is astounded. And Jesus' praise of this man's faith is no little thing. In fact, it probably bristled a lot of the people in that crowd. People who had been faithful Jews for their whole lives, and now Jesus is highlighting this out-of-nowhere guy from the other side and saying that he has greater faith than any of the people of Israel? Just goes to show this is no ordinary story. I like to imagine that this phrase that Jesus says is one that touched the centurion deeply, one that he would remember and carry with him for a long time, words that shaped his life. Then almost as an afterthought, the story concludes, when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Oh, by the way, he's not sick anymore. See what I mean about the physical healing not being the main theme of the story? So I talked through most of that story. But let's zoom out. From top to bottom, this is a story of unlikely people coming together to help an unlikely person. People using their words to unite themselves for the healing and wholeness of one who is vulnerable and in need. And while we hear that the slave is ultimately found in good health, I wonder what else has been healed in all of this. I wonder what relationships were healed, what prejudices were healed, what animosities and assumptions were healed. If you paid close attention, you'll notice that the Roman never actually met Jesus. He just sent some friends. This was teamwork all the way through. This was communication at its best. And not because of the fancy words used or the persuasive arguments that were made. This was 100% words spoken from the heart and for each other. Originally, in picking out the hashtag for this week, which, by the way, is speak the word. We'll get to that in just a minute. 
I was all set to do a message on the power of God's word and how God speaks things into being. It would be great, and you'll hear it at some point, I'm sure. But it's going to have to wait, because imagine my dismay when I actually read the text carefully and find out that Jesus doesn't speak a word of healing. He doesn't speak much at all. It's all these other groups speaking for each other. So what's a girl to do? A hashtag about speaking the word, and then a text all about unlikely teamwork, and then it hit me like a freight train. Our words have power too. Our words make a difference. Our words can bring us together or tear us apart, mend relationships or start wars, create beauty or cause devastation. Our words can build community or build barriers. Our words can sing melodies, praise beauty, raise hope, nurture love. And when you have a tool as powerful as that on the tip of your tongue, why on earth would you use it for harm? We've all heard and perhaps repeated the old phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, pardon my French, but that's a load of crap. I bet every one of us could stand up and share a word or phrase that cut us to the core and destroyed us in the moment. I hope with all the hope I have that there have been enough lovely and beautiful and true words in your life to heal those wounds. Because I bet every one of us could stand up and share a word or phrase that gave us hope, gave us power, gave us life, gave us courage, gave us inspiration. So here's our challenge. How can we use our words this week to bring people together like they did in today's gospel text? To build each other up, to mend relationships and heal the brokenhearted, to bring sunshine and warmth into a cold January day. Speak the word and make a difference. This week, I want you to blow up our Instagram and Twitter feeds, which I know you're all very excited to do, with words that inspire you or words that you've shared to inspire others. Snap pictures of the messages of hope you see around you. Share quotes or poems or songs that bring you joy. Because chances are, if those words have a powerful effect on you, they can do that for someone else as well. Our gospel story for today shows just how powerful, loving, and healing words can be. Speak the word and make a difference. I want to close with a word from the Dalai Lama. He posted this on Facebook, which, by the way, is another great place to post your inspirational words. He posted this on New Year's Day, and he said, Today, as we wish each other a happy new year, let us determine to be more sincere, compassionate, warm-hearted human beings, trying to make our world a more equal place. That way, we'll actually make it a happy year. Let's do it, you guys, and let's do it together. Speak the word, make a difference.